21. Roll call, please. Anderson present. Booth present. Morano present. Mustafi present. Ms. Dutt present. Wilson present. Brady present for us. Wilson for region. So we'll start with public comment. Um, we are lucky to have both Zoom capability and in person capability. A reminder we'll give speakers three minutes to speak. Um, this is. Do you want to queue up the Zoom uh, yep. and raising function yep, while sure. we take any comments in the room? Okay. okay. Um, so if you are on Zoom, please raise your hand through the participants' uh, you know, hand raise function, and uh, we will call on you on the order. We will uh, first have the people in live in the room. Um, and I'm just going to note that because our policy of having uh, masks in the buildings, we're asking that if you if if you can't wear a mask um, going forward and you have comments to make please opt to use our zoom feature rather than our live in person feature uh, so we'll start with the people in the room yes yes please state your name um, and your address you think it'll work there Close enough, right? And you're yeah. just turn that microphone on. I'm just Let me help you out. It's on the bottom. It's on the bottom first. Okay. Yeah. Tracy, give me that one. I'll take this one. Okay. There we go. Okay. I'm Monica Rainfield. Wenton Carlisle, Pines Drive, Carlisle, Mass. Thank you for allowing me this time to speak tonight. I'd like to ask about the American Rescue Plan Act signed into law on March 11th, 2021. For those unfamiliar with this, this law provides $1.9 trillion to assist in recovery from COVID-19 and $122 billion, sorry, of this money. Let me just fix this, it's tricky stuff. Um, Okay, billion dollars of this money is allocated to state education agencies and school districts. 18 billion, I can't read these things, allocated for testing. Per the Associated Press, Concord Public Schools will receive a total of $1.44 million and with about 2,065 students, that's about $701 per student. This money comes with the strings attached. In order to qualify for funding, each school plan needs uh, <clears throat> needed to include information about the extent to which the school or school system intends to address centers for disease control guidance in these areas, universal and correct wearing a mask, physical distancing, contact tracing, isolating, quarantine, in collaboration with the state, local and health departments, screening and diagnostic testing, efforts to improve vaccination rates with educators, other staff and students. The school system is required to review its plan at least every six months through September, 2023. This implies that the federal government and schools intend to be engaged in COVID management for at least another 26 months. The CDC is also mainly privately funded by the pharmaceutical industry, which tells us we need to look at all the science, not just the industry funded politicized science. Why aren't we questioning any CDC guidelines? My question is what role did these incentives play in influencing the decision making? Will they influence us to 2023? How are these funds going to be allocated? Please do not let the federal government's money cloud our better judgments. Thank you. Uh, Bill, I wonder, might we have a copy of that just so we have it verbatim from you? Is that okay? Oh. Yeah. Is this okay to submit it? Wonderful. No, that's fine. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Bob Lana. Bob Lana here. Yes, uh, thank you. Bob Lana here, 72 Finnegan Way. Um, still hard to hear um, the, the meeting room. So just want to provide that feedback. Maybe there'll be a um, uh, transcript uh, of this so that uh, folks can follow along more easily. Um, yeah, I only have three minutes. So I'll uh, focus my comments on uh, the uh, meeting that happened on the 24th. Um, and so I thought there were a number of good points 
um, that were raised in that meeting. And there's there is a recording available, but I wanted to try to summarize some key points and get it out to the broader school committee so that you can do your important work. Um, and I just want to say also, I really appreciate the effort that uh, you're all putting in and, and hope that these are words of encouragement for you. Um, so approximately 5.53 in the uh, recording, uh, Susan Rass mentioned that there were, uh, and I apologize if I mispronounce anyone's name, 31 COVID cases um, in the student population. And, and we'll probably get an update from that today, but that's about one to 2% of the total student population. Um, the, a very small, percentage, I think, was uh, what Dr. Hunter said at uh, the 33 minute mark. Um, Trisha began, I oh, know, I'm sorry, Susan also mentioned at the nine minute mark that about 95% of the reported students were vaccinated. Uh, hopefully we'll get an un update on that, but that's a very high vaccination rate. And then also at the 14 minute rate, 14 minute mark, Susan mentioned that a 3% positivity rate uh, which I think is based on the total uh, sampling size, it's considered the threshold. So I guess my first question is if we were at one to two percent and three percent is the threshold, you know where where are we really at uh, at the threat level? Um, the other interesting point made by Susan, and it was on the slides at the fifteen minute mark, that um, it, that it, if the population gets eighty percent vaccinated, the student, population, then uh, there may be uh, a, an ability to lift the mag mass mandate, quote, depending how things go. And I would really like to understand from the school board committee what, um, what that statement implies. We really would like to get a clear understanding of, uh, again, what the criteria are uh, for lifting it or um, possibly putting in more controls. Um, Dr. Hunter mentioned at 25 minutes that all the teachers are going to get vaccinated by the 17th of October. Um, so I just say personally, I was really hoping that that would be a day one requirement. Um, I know that there's a lot of constraints you're working on, but um, if there's unvaccinated adults um, in the Concord school system, I really see that as, as you know, an, an un unnecessary risk. Um, I realize it's going to get taken care of. Um, Tricia mentioned at 32 minutes, there's no hospitalization. And then at 43 minutes, there was a very interesting set of statements by uh, Jennifer. And I'm sorry I didn't get her last name, but she's a, a parent in the community. And I don't believe any of these were contraindicated that um, more children are dying from the flu than COVID. You know, I looked that up. And that, that appears to be accurate. Um, so what we're really dealing with here, as far as I can understand, is a, is a flu type situation. And uh, I don't recall you know, putting together um, a series of tight restrictions based upon uh, flus in the past. Um, Jennifer also mentioned, and I've also um, looked at this up in my Sorry. time. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, just a point, point of reference for anybody in the audience, this is a business meeting, as was the last one, so we would not have had discourse with uh, the party that we spoke of, um, because we're... Well, uh, well yeah, I, I, we're I, all, I know, and, and that's... I'll ask, that. I'll ask if you'd be so kind if you bring any uh, additional questions specifically our way, so we can uh, take those under advisement. Yeah, that, that's fine. I mean, the reason that I'm pointing this out is so that you will go and, and look at the recording and, and incorporate that. But, um, you know, I, I, I think there's a lot of good information. I, I don't know if I'm at time or not. That's, if, if I am, that's fine. I'll, I'll be quiet. But, um, I, yeah, I, I really only have a couple of more, of more points. I mean, um, uh, Basically, what we're looking at is if there's a positive case, um, students are going to have to isolate for 10 days. And that's a lot of school to be missed. Um, so I'm just urging the school board to come up with some creative solutions. I think we all agree that kids need to be in school. 
And uh, I'm really you know, hopeful that the board is going to uh, come up with a solution that's, uh, that's going to work for everyone, especially the kids. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And I uh, forgive me for interrupting, but I'll continue to do that just so we honor that uh, time limit. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Terry Ackerman. Hi, I'm Terry Ackerman, um, 89 Heathbridge Road. I'm chair of the select board and I'm the liaison from the select board to the school committee. And I just want to remind and invite the entire school committee to attend our select board meetings coming up on September 20th. We are going to be having a meeting devoted solely to the middle school, uh, not the design or anything. This is going to be a brainstorming session on alternative revenues that we can come up with to offset the cost. Um, second meeting I want to invite you to is September 27th, a week later. Um, the uh, superintendent and town manager will be jointly um, proposing their capital plan to the school committee and the select board on that night. And finally, I want to say that whenever the middle school building committee and the school committee are ready, uh, we, the select board stands ready to put on our agenda uh, to call the special town meeting whenever, um, you know, just give us a lot of notice as much as you can, and we will put it on our agenda. Thank you. If there are no more comments, then Uh, and we'll move on to chairs and liaisons reports. And before we do, I just want to take a minute to say thank you to everybody in the school community for a smooth back to school. I mean, it was, it's fantastic to see kids out on the playing fields and everybody getting to their work. And just, um, it's just, it's, you hear, and, and thank you to the community for, um, for just these constructive past few and really the past year and a half, but but especially you know, um, patients cooperation and um, and um, all of that really it's um, it's like it's really really nice. Um, and um, and part of that beginning was a wonderful presentation with a guest speaker to the, the faculty and staff um, opening meeting with Grace Lynn, who is just, uh, she's a superstar. And um, she shared uh, an extended version of a TED talk, a TEDx talk that she's done. And I highly recommend that people seek out her uh, the TEDx talk or if there's any kind of extended version of it that you can find. Um, it was just, it was a very coherent and insightful um, uh, explanation and, and um, discussion about, about DEI and, and really about finding your own your own personal growth and your path to your own personal growth and how important that is. Um, and so thank you for for, for inviting her um, and sharing that. Yeah. I don't have any other reports. Uh, so I'd like to extend uh, your thanks beyond that to uh, the uh, citizens who have joined our meeting. Uh, thank you for being here tonight. Uh, I can report on behalf of the uh, middle school building committee uh, and report that there is a meeting this Thursday morning, 7.30. Uh, we are getting to delve more deeply into some of the finishing uh, conversations, but we still have uh, other fundamental uh, parts of our uh, building plan still in discussion. Uh, the design subcommittee met this morning and uh, we came out in favor of uh, one of the exterior designs of four that were presented to us, uh, details to follow. Uh, because we make no decisions as a, as a subcommittee, only the full committee uh, does that. And we uh, know that we have been able to maintain the 25% wall to window ratio with some 
uh, the fine tuning of north and south facing windows. We've uh, uh, chosen a simplified window design from several that came our way. You'll see all those graphics uh, in the meeting minutes from this morning that will soon be posted or in the full committee uh, this Thursday morning. And finally, it was the opinion of the subcommittee this morning that alternative solutions to an auditorium in the form of possible hybrid split auditoriums with folding seats and possible partitions uh, were examined, uh, I think, with, with uh, good care. And the consensus was that the traditional 420 seat single auditorium uh, would serve the needs of the school and the community uh, best. So I think those are the very set to comport with your. Yeah, that's a zero. Thank you. And I just like to say that I think there's a lot going on with the building committee, that probably we should have a discussion about it at our 14th meeting. Also, just to take care of the item um, that the select board is specifically asking about is the cost savings, um, which already responded to. Thank you very much. And for those of our audience that are interested in this, do we have a public forum scheduled yet? We do not. Okay, so that's fine. Um, and I think that's it for the building project. We did have a seminar this morning, to your point, if I may, that uh, from a community member uh, and our FinCom server, that uh, at a community forum, uh, we would be well to revisit the, uh, let's call it the community-facing uh, benefits of the middle school. So I suspect that would be included on the docket. Okay, very good. Update from Concord uh, Carlisle Adults and Community Education. Uh, the committee will continue uh, meeting on Zoom at 11. Uh, next meeting, September 17th, if anyone is interested. Uh, uh, the, they have some exciting programs that are, uh, they already are coming out in the fall. One of them, Can We Talk program. Uh, another exciting uh, uh, events that are coming from the Robbins House, Concord African American History. Um, there are uh, some interesting events, uh, example, reckoning with a racial past, um, white concrete letters from early civil rights activists. So some interesting uh, uh, programs uh, mm -hmm. coming coming out as well. Uh, we have the brochure in the mail. I encourage that everybody, that, everybody gets it. Concrete and title. Yeah. And drivers at is it pool? Swing. Good. Any other reports? No, no. Okay. Okay. On to correspondence. I'm going to actually uh, move you back to the minutes. And oh, yes. yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Uh, there we go. Uh, okay, uh, and we have a motion, please, to accept the minutes. Oh no, that's comfort. That's just comfort. But they're only under school commitments. I'm sorry. Uh, so, can I have a motion to accept the minutes of July 7th, July 12th, and July 15, 2021? So moved. A second. Okay. Discussion. These are the open session. Correct. Thank you. Discussion? All right. Can I entertain a motion for the executive session minutes from July 7th, July 12th, and July 15th? Are these conference school committee only? Yes. 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 Okay. Just yeah. here. Thank you very much. Uh, so moved. I'll second. second. Okay. Any discussion? I know there is. And I'll take a roll call, please. Anderson, aye. Who's aye? Milano, aye. Ms. Dunn, aye. Brady, aye. All right. So that takes care of our minutes, I believe. Thank you, Dr. Hunter. <laughs> you can thank Aaron. Enjoy the green card. 
Uh, so on the correspondence, on the regional side, I had seven seven correspondents, um, all about school and school protocols. Probably more than that, but it's hard to tell sometimes. I think people just submit to Congress. Probably 12 to 15. Yeah. Yeah. All the ones with questions leading up to the right pool. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you everyone for, for reaching out to us. We appreciate um, all the feedback and the correspondence. It's very better. Okay. Discussion back to school date. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, so, so to take Sarah's lead and just extend that, teachers returned last Thursday. Um, you know, I, I have to admit, I was a uh, little chagrined that we went virtual um, for the large staff gathering that normally happens with K-12 all in the same room, and that's the second year in a row being virtual. But I honestly don't think we lost anything, much to the credit of um, Grace Lynn and the way in which she brought this, and I'm looking at Kristen, she's responsible for bringing Grace to us. Um, so it was a morning of welcome backs, and I think a lot of positive sentiments expressed by some of Sarah on your behalf, um, the union presidents, and then really the rest was all Grace, um, and really what a storyteller communicating with us her personal journey both professionally and um, in terms of self-identity as race and how the two intertwine and ultimately became the same. Um, while she had us drawing in between chapter, I'll call them chapters of the story, and the part we benefited from that isn't on the TED Talk is having her illustrations from a number of her books as she told, told the tale, um, which really just was really, really rich. And something really interesting happened. I, we had so many, and this did too. So many teachers said it felt like she was speaking just to them. I don't know if we would have gotten that in person. It's so interesting how the technology, it felt really intimate. I, I totally agree. So it was a great kickoff. Um, teachers met as faculty back in the schools over the course of Thursday and Friday. Because I didn't get to see them in person, I asked the principals to stagger the staff meeting. So the five of us up here on the staff meeting, the staff meeting um, over the course of the two days, which is a keeper. Um, it's something we should continue to do because it was a great way for us to see them in a smaller set. Because even if we've been in person, it's so big we can't really connect. So. It was a great couple of days. Teachers got all ready, ready to roll and um, all set up for the kids. And uh, I can't believe it's only been two days. But <laughs> the kids about came in yesterday. We have actually not been ready to really smell the now because even transportation, not major, major hiccups, which is always a challenge. Um, this year, maybe a little more so as we bring all the kids back on the bus. Uh, overall, things have gone really, really well. Um, I've been out in schools as to as have some of them. And the energy is really, really positive. The kids are excited to be here. Things that came back, despite the COVID, we're still bringing things back that we didn't have last year. Uh, a certain high rate for sure is the elementary specialists being live and in person. Everywhere but the road, you get to leave, get out and leave the room and go to music, go to gym, throw get there. We just you know, have a way of repair that to do that. Um, but just kudos, middle school is coming, high school is coming. Um, we jumped in feet first, um, felt feels like we're just off and rolling. And a lot of great conversations with teachers and kids about um, middle school, especially I noticed, and I'm sure they're all doing it, but we haven't catch them doing it. Just a lot of messages of, you know, we're out here to take risks and try things and it's, you're going to make mistakes and the journey is to struggle together and that's how you're actually going to learn. And, Really, really good foundations being set. A lot of get to know your activities, a lot of you know, make learning needs and things like that. But a lot of community building, which is really what we were hoping to happen. So it's been a great, great start. Like I said, two days, but um, it feels like we're back in the back where we, one of the teachers said to me, it feels like we picked up right where we left off. And um, in many ways, that's that's true. I think the good news is we're all the more rested and uh, feel more energized as we go forward in the new year. But it's been a really great start. So thank you to all of you and the work you did to help us line up what our protocols were going to be and get those executed. Um, and we'll continue to bring you good news. 
Dr. Hunter, can I ask about uh, personnel? Um, yes. Not that I have any uh, agenda or, or anything here, but rather I know that uh, August is always a busy month, but I know other districts yes. are undergoing some real challenges. Are you comfortable with that where we stand right now? Overall, yes. Um, I would say uh, any professional positions, we got teaching positions, even a couple of very great resignations. We've been able to get a pool and attract really high quality people. Probably popping in another district and creating another issue over there, but um, we just beg forgiveness. Uh, the place we're still sort of working at it is support staff. Um, we did, I hope that you never get, uh, potentially add some supervisors back. This lunch is now outside and it's not what it was last year, but we still would like the extra hands. We've had mixed results with that. Um, we've had need for a couple of monitors with some special education students and a little bit of a struggle there. Um, but that's the you only know, spot, and I think it's working itself out as the week goes on. It's, it's a really, I mean, part of the month is custodial. We're actually struggling more than anywhere else, I, I would say. Thankfully, our bus drivers are uh, overall, I think we have one transition. Most of them are returning, so you're seeing the headlines there. So we're so grateful about <laughs> The commitment of our drivers and um, all the you know efforts we make to give them great working conditions, so they continue to stick with us and are as enjoyed by our families as always. But thanks for asking. It's definitely challenging times in certain areas of time. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Update. Yeah, so I we I mean, we want to give you highlights of where we were on day two. So I'll just remind you it's day two. Um, <laughs> however, we did get the first chance, you know, you back to COVID as the staff had returned and kids were about to. Um, so we had two adult cases, breakthrough cases of vaccinated people, and that's probably worth we will track that. Mm -hmm. um, and and three um, students who had not been to school yet. But we decided to start tracking it if they miss any school because of it. So it'll be that little blip here at the beginning. Um, so we'll knock on wood, but that's where we are right now. Uh, I wanted to bring you vaccine information that we had discussed uh, collecting. So I'm going to screen share because I think that would be easier. So we, and I'll preface the staff data by saying this is. A little bit soft because we are in the process right now of actually gathering scan vaccine cards, but I knew you would want data tonight, so um, we did it this way so we have that to work with while we aggregate all the rest and get that in our hands, and that'll happen quickly over the month of September. Um, so, just in a quick check with the staff uh, over the last two days, voluntary survey 424 of them responded. Um, out of the 424, they are all vaccinated, but eight. So that's, I think, an outstanding starting place. Um, this is the breakout of Alcott. The room, I'm going to go to the percentages. I think it's a little easier to see. That's who answered. So we haven't broken out who's, pub, who's vaccinated by building yet. So I'll just show you the aggregate. Sorry, I thought it was broken out. This is some responses, so that's probably the easiest way to look at it and know that you've got eight among all of those um, who are not fully vaccinated. So our percentages are very, very high for staff, and I know we're going to talk about the policy. Jared and I continue to work with the um, remaining union leaders to work through collaborative agreements there. Very close, a um, little bit left to do this week. Um, and then I think our intent in talking about a policy is uh, we need an umbrella for the non-union people. There's no other way. You, you need some process in order to ask them to also be vaccinated. Um, so the policy, you're going to look at a first reading of tonight with the new umbrella that would allow for that. But overall, we're in excellent shape. And um, I'll tell you some of the best people are actually submitting and um, continue to bring those updates to you. 426 is what percentage of the entire staff? That is usually I use a number of 700. 
Yeah. So we'll want to tighten up and obviously as, we, as they submit, they'll get closer. People are going to have the whole body, right? Exactly. Um, and then students, and this is harder data. Grades uh, seven and eight, we have 71 and 75 percent of the kids are vaccinated, and that would go up a little if we included the ones with one dose, which is not they are not in that percentage. Um, and then grades nine through 12, we're at 80 or better across all of those. <laughs> I told Sarah earlier. Mr. Mastrula let the kids know if we had a vaccine on record, they would not be quarantined and um whoosh and they may all have their own takes them on and so it came. <laughs> um, so we're in excellent shape there as well. And again, that's with things still coming in. Um, but we're really pleased and those are, those are cards actually uploaded. Yes, okay. yes, those are either cards uploaded, the middle school data is actually off the state portal because there is a repository mm -hmm. that any vaccine provider has to submit to. So we're getting it from both directions and cross checking. Okay. All in work in progress, but those numbers are real either through the state portal or through the actual cards that we have. Yes, I believe there's some number floating that says 95%. So that's off the DPH oh, yeah. aggregate numbers. So it could be we can get to that as we keep getting cars in. Um, certainly, that is what the DPH is reporting. So this should only go up. Thank you. You're welcome. And, and that's part of our, our COVID update. Um, we decided as a group that we would check on our policies on uh, on our protocols um, every two weeks, and um, and specifically today to talk a little bit about the mask policy, um, and and really explore our um, you know what what mitigation options are there to us, and and what we hope to to get out of them. Right? We got a we health experts, including the CDC and the American Academy of Pediatrics, are currently recommending the use of masks for all students K through 12. And then, in partnership with local health authorities, with the administration, we created or renewed our mask policy for the year. Um, and then, shortly thereafter, DESE also issued a universal mask mandate. But they made it effective immediately and through what they say at least October 1st while they look at quote unquote possible off ramps mm -hmm. for schools. Um, and I think it's worth just kind of touching them to, to talk as a group about what possible off ramps there are and to understand our mitigations that we have. We have distance, we have ventilation, with masks, vaccination, screening, contact tracing. Um, and the metrics that we have are our vaccination rates, our test positivity, and our, and our case counts. Um, and so we should start thinking about what information do we need to add to determine um, if the schools can make masks optional. And, and what does it mean to remove one of these mitigations? Um, I think that's really a critical thing that, that we need to talk about. Um, and you know, do we want to be leaders or followers um, yes. in this? Um, and I think and Alexa, you you had know, some good thoughts about this. yeah, it's nice. So when we talked here today, and in light of like how we have been engaging with the public, either as individuals on the street or in these forums, one of the things that I keep coming back to, especially from the subset of the population that is not thrilled about mask mandates. I, I, I keep going back to this idea about something that maybe would be helpful to communicate, which is I don't think any one of us fashions ourselves as a public health expert, nor are we fashioning ourselves creators of public health policy. And so I think when we look at these policies, I just think it's important for the public to know, we look at our policies with like one thing in mind, which is like our policies need to create conditions that allow our, our teachers to like effectively and efficiently educate our students. That's it. Like that's the only thing our policies are doing. We are not 
you know, trying to, these are not policies that are going to keep kids out of the hospital. This is about keeping conditions appropriate so that teachers can teach and students can learn. And I think, obviously, the single most important of those conditions is that students are in the building and teachers are in the building. So, like, all we're trying to achieve through our policies are to create conditions that allow as many teachers as possible and as many students as possible to be in those buildings. We are not trying to achieve anything else. Um, and I think what we need to do, like you said, like we've got five or six mitigations that are available to us. And obviously vaccinations are the best, but I think the elephant in the room is that we've got like a big subset of kids that through no fault of their own can't get vaccinated. They live in mixed households. We have kids that are vaccinated. And I think <sighs> until we get to a place where those five to 11 year old cohort of kids can have access to a vaccine, we need to have as many of these like layers as possible. I always like look at that like Swiss cheese graphic where like the more layers you add on, the harder it is for that virus to get through. And sure, when we have conditions on the ground where the entirety of our the populations that we serve, five to you know, grade five to no, sorry, grade K to twelve, that is I think a really good time to talk about offering thing or what you know, but I think it's gonna be a tricky conversation before then. And again, I just think the big piece that people need to understand is we just want kids and teachers in schools, on the playing fields, in the auditoriums, wherever they are, doing whatever they love, and that's that's it. And I think that our policies just need to reflect that and that alone. And I think they do. I think they do. So, I don't know. It's a nuance, but I think it's an important one. So, I just want to be sure that Alexis us speak for herself. Yeah, yeah, of course. Okay, of course. <laughs> no, of course. I have a little bit of different take. I do think it is our responsibility as a school committee to have policies to keep our kids safe. And I don't just see it as keeping a productive environment in the schools. But I think it is our imperative that we execute policies at the recommendation of the superintendent to keep our community safe. And we are doing wearing masks to keep our most vulnerable, though maybe not the population that gets the sickest, from getting sick. And those are not just our students in our class, but student, you know, children of our staff, um, siblings of our students. And I do think, you know, I do want very much want to keep everybody in school. And that's, of course, a big part of the mask mandate. But I do think, uh, for me, it's important to keep everybody safe and healthy. I think we've seen a lot of evidence that the Delta is vicious. And I've heard a statistic today that up to 300 kids are going to the hospital every day. So this is not last year's COVID. Um, so I think we have to be very careful and move carefully and slowly because this Delta is uh, just so much more contagious, much more, I think, deadly version of COVID, and I, um, I do think it's very important to try to do everything we can to keep everybody in our communities, communities safe. So, yeah, and I think it's worth noting that last June, in June, when, when we were confident that school would be open with fewer precautions in place, right, and that, that, you know, we weren't in the same place then, and I know that people were frustrated that they feel the goalposts keep moving or that we're changing. But the fact is that Delta is a new playing field. It's it, 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 it's it's a new game that it's it's not uh, we don't have we don't have the same information that we had before. We have a new variant um that is whatever it is, 80 to 90 percent of cases yeah. right now. And it is highly more infectious, it is highly more contagious, um, and does seem to be impacting. 
younger people more, and I don't know if it's that they're more exposed to it because of openings and fewer professions across the board. Or, I mean, that's something that we're not here to, to tease out, right? Um, and, and I know there are questions about, about the severity of the disease, and if it's only so few kids that are that really get sick from it, like, should that be a consideration that we have? But the fact is that the public guidance is that if you are positive, you have to quarantine at home. And so to Alexa's point, right, mm -hmm. that we're, we have to follow that guidance. Right. So, this, so this book, so, and a way to keep as many people in the building yes. as possible and to mitigate the transmission of the disease is through the man wearing his mask, right? right? We're achieving all of those goals, right? right? So, yes. So I don't think, I don't think, I personally don't think we need to discuss on, you know, is this more dangerous, less dangerous, or not yeah. like that, right? We know what the public health recommendations are, what the state's guidelines are, um, and we know that at a minimum, we have to adhere to those, mm -hmm. right? For now. Yep. For now. Yep. Um, I, just, I, I just wanted to add, um, uh, myself, I represent both sides, right? And we have um, all sorts of, all part, the parents on both sides. And we have no, parents, no, no, no. parents all these with, with, yes. with, um, with children that are unvaccinated, with children yeah. that, that are vaccinated. Now, we have to make sure till uh, parents that cannot make the decision about the child's health because the child is too young, we have to make sure that we do protect those ch children mm -hmm. just as much. And we allow these parents to make health decisions for, for, for their own children just as much as parents that don't feel that vaccination is important in their child's life. So till that uh, situation changes for, for that uh, uh, age group, it, it is necessary to take all of the precautions that, that are possible in our heads. All of the tools that we have deployed last year and we we're successful. We we're one, uh, one of the few districts that brought students to learn in person. Uh, deploy all of those tools Till we learn more. Mm -hmm. yep. And the state provided us with free tools. They, they provided us with COVID testing. Uh, in addition to, to the tool that we have, we are not mandating our high school students to, to get to get pull tests, but to take the pull test right now, just the athletes. So until we have a good understanding what is happening in our student population. We need to keep the masks on. And to your point about it, I mean, one is that Delta is new, that a lot of the information, we're going to get a lot more information from the, the, the screening that we do with the athletes, right? And we'll have a much better sense of really what's happening in our community. Um, and that may inform us in, in, in I don't know. But I, I wonder also if it's worth considering it. Um, Protocols. Are there other groups, other yeah, other um, student activities that we think um, it's also worth having that same mandatory testing for? Yeah, the one that comes to mind um, it, are the folks the most joyous about getting back to some normalcy is the music folks who have been singing and obviously the wind instruments. They're going to be inside. They're excited about that. They are going to be masked, um, but they are also going to be projecting. So that that's my first instinct would be that would be the other group. The athletes were because of the close contact and such. This is another pretty reasonable way to approach a little higher risk. So let's get some testing going there. Just know if know that we're doing it safely versus hoping we're doing it safely. But we strongly encourage people to participate. We're not discouraging anybody. No, yes, not. In fact, we're urging. Yes, urging was the word I used yeah. to say. The higher the participation of the athletes, it's mandatory. The athletes have been mandated. We could consider making it mandatory for like a respiratorily projective. Yeah, I would probably um, have the entire course of bands go and not select certain instruments because they're all going to be in the same vicinity yeah. of, the, right, right, right. Exactly. of that environment. And that'd be middle school and high school. I would say middle school and high school. The elementary music folks are not singing or playing those instruments because they see 400 kids during the week and didn't 
want to go there. So okay. it's a middle okay. high school discussion. <laughs> And theater is all yeah. masked, right? Yeah. It's, it's a straight play in the fall. It's a straight play in the fall. But but theater way. spends a significant amount of time together as a group, True. you know, so they can be together for three months, as a sport would also be together for yeah. three months. So, so that might be considered. Consider. It feels more egalitarian to me, like to expand that array of people protesting, and it certainly would be a benefit. I think I think most of them would be like because they're so excited to get back to some music here. And it's been a long, long road for them. I think for me, and I don't think it should go without saying, the biggest biggest precaution we took all of last year was the distancing. And we are now relaxing that down to three feet and even being a little generous with it where where it makes sense to be, so they can teach a little bit differently than in the rows. Um, I don't think we want to lose track of the fact that that's mitigation. We are relaxing some, and while we're looking at all these other options, it's a variable for sure. So, you know, we don't want to go back to six feet. That's incredibly prohibited, and we can't get all the kids back to snow that way. We're going to three. We're trying it a little more flexibly so they get a few more options, not all day, but for some activities. I mean, I feel like I want to see what Delta does in that environment as well, because we don't have any experience there with Delta and the distance changing and hallways not being one way and all that good stuff that's making it feel like school. Um, so I just don't want to lose track of that change. Buses full with kids, you know, yeah. on and on. So. Yeah. The success our Dr. Hunter, would be to keep everyone uh, in school through the full uninterrupted year, correct? Certainly, that's a huge goal, right? Yes. Um, is to succeed there. And I think to Cynthia's point that as we succeed there, we're also keeping people safe so that two happen awesome. simultaneously. We were uh, generally very, very successful with that mm -hmm. last year, just with our kind of slow, deliberate yep. approach. And, and yet not static. I think we want to be sure we're stressing that. Nobody wants to stay static. No. In July, these were gone, folks, right? This building didn't, have, you know, we didn't have the signs up. We did let it go. Back in the day, the kids were gone. The rates were so low. The teachers were in the schools without masks for the oh, last yeah. two days. And we were celebrating, thinking, that was it. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, sure. we are not going to stay sick. And I guess, um, from my perspective, I do think it is critical to have all the data in front of us yeah. and be transparent with parents and the teachers and the students, like, here's where we're at today. Yeah. And just to keep revisiting that in terms of vaccinations, in terms of COVID cases, and if people can see it right in front of them, I think it's it's easier to say, okay, I understand why we're wearing the mask. Right. Um, but I think that it just be as transparent as we possibly can. Yeah, so I'll play with the dashboard that went up weekly. I think we do want to add the vaccine status. I think that's worth noting there. Um, I definitely want to note the breaks for cases on the vaccinations because that's much of what the health officials have been tracking this summer, and now we'll have our own uh, and any other data points. It captures already the pool testing and whether or not we've had cases come out of that. So. And just for clarity, do you, of the unvaccinated staff, do you know which buildings they're in? Or I do you not know that? You do, but I not do. the general population. And with all this data, Dr. Hunter, will you be able, it seems like we, you will be able to make decisions that are really based on the uh, local decisions that are really based in our own particular situation versus comparing us to other places that might not uh, behave or look the same. Is that yeah, exactly because all these variables are now going to be facts and we want to make that be what's informing all the decisions that we're making for sure. One thing I think is worth noting, Jesse's been very clear, you have to have at least 80 percent vaccinated in the schools in order to even consider changing the mask. I know we're right about there and that won't be an issue, but it's worth noting they have set one very strong benchmark and they have already said, we were on the committee with the commissioner earlier, anyone unvaccinated will have to stay masked, which I think was our expectation, but it but is who's going to enforce that? That's, that's just, that's well, that's the trick. Yeah. That is the trick. So yeah. that's, that's the problem. Is so we can't we can't do that. Do that. Awesome. Yeah. Cash that out tonight. Mm -hmm. We will, uh, I think, just have to move forward based on the data, the scientific recommendations, and get this is going to evolve, you know? 
two weeks from now, I think we'll yes. have very different information. We'll certainly have a conversation, full hearted conversation about where we are in two weeks. We'll have begun the testing, um, we'll have new vaccination rates, and we'll have a lot of other data around us. John McCord, did you? Well, I can be very brief. Uh, my own opinion, we're halfway through a global pandemic and we're doing all right. Uh, layered approaches to your point in schools have worked magnificently. Um, Alexa, I think you stated our primary goal, but Cynthia, to your point, uh, I think the schools, uh, notably Concord and Carlisle, contributed to the larger community public health goals, as they should have. Um, so, Back to where we started, uh, what can we relax and when? I'm happy to have that conversation, but not with any kind of time certain because I am completely in favor of the precautionary measures that we have taken. Uh, difficult though they may be, um, I think we've uh, protected kids from the uh, psychic harm of masks and uh, other, other things that uh, they've had to be uh, cautious about. Uh, I think they have risen to the challenge because our adults have risen to the challenge. And we're happy to see that we continue that. Um, we're, we're following the science, I think, very appropriately, and uh, nothing in our messaging from our public health experts locally has given us any response uh, at all and we have so far. Um, I had in my idle moments wondered, should we have a first read of any policies so they're in our back pocket where they have to move fast. And my answer is no, I don't think so. I think uh, our superintendent has the necessary authority to move fast, even if this committee can't. So, comfortable, right? Very comfortable. I want to um, congratulate everyone um, for, for a successful start and uh, accommodating the different uh, needs and following closely uh, the development of, of, uh, of the situation. And um, yes, it is difficult. We all have to make difficult choices. And um, I think we're all doing our best to ensure that our children are getting their education and uh, all the staff are, are, are safe. So um, again, thank you. Great. So, as a follow up to that, uh, let's look at policy EDC FAA. This is a first reading. I am sure it's okay. Then I didn't know she's there. <laughs> so, I like talking to them. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Everyone had a chance to read this before. I'm pulling it up now. Can you uh, start uh, with sourcing on this? Sure. So, and this is a um, locally developed policy. Uh, much of it's come from discussions with uh, the union leadership as we've worked through MLA agreements with them. Um, they certainly uh, worked and looked at the MTA document. I did consult with uh, district legal counsel. Um, it's evolved from those numbers of sources. So just for point of clarity, we didn't have a vote on no, for tonight because I think you've got time okay. while so we're wrapping up other things. Okay. So we're happy to just talk tonight and you know, I don't know, know, know there would be any agenda. No, that's okay. I just thought it so it's okay because our next meeting is 14th. 14th. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, I mean I have to might move the date a little if we push it up, so I think we're heading in the right direction. So. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So um, we don't need any questions, just to does anyone have questions about this or? Yeah, I, I can just give you a couple of high level points of what's here. Uh, one is the date was selected because it's intended to allow someone who hasn't had any vaccinations to get both shots. 
and still have a two-week waiting period. So that's why it's October 17th and not sooner. Mm -hmm. um, it does think forward and provide a provision for a booster shot, expecting those will likely come. Um, and I just, I think we want to be sure we're noting medical and religious exemptions are here. They legally have to be. Mm -hmm. um, processes for either of those require documentation um, submitted to me. I'm the one who can grant the exemption. Um, obviously, a medical one might consult with one of the lead nurse, maybe Lisa mm -hmm. Cosby, um, and the health officials. But otherwise, uh, there is no um, provision not to be vaccinated. The Middle ground step, like Governor Baker's policy says, you're either in those two categories for exemption or you're vaccinated, or you don't have a job here. Yes. We were looking for a little bit of breathing space just because all this is new and kind of happening quickly. That if someone lands in that position, they would go on an unpaid leave for the year, and that would give us a chance to catch our breath mm -hmm. um, and figure out what our next plan is going to be. So I just wanted okay. to note that that's meant to. Soften that status if we somehow land there um, rather than the carte blanche definitive, you no longer are an employee here. Obviously, we'd be back in that conversation um, as we revise policy and such down the road, but it would get us to the Thank you. I, I had a question in terms of, uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Hunter, you have uh, probably answered most of my questions. I just had a question regarding that time, October 17th. Um, because there is a month um, between the first and the second dose. Yes. So when we vote on this, right. you may want to modify the date. Do we give, yes, yeah, so right. do we have give uh, people enough time to right. take right. time to get the vaccination? Right. So this, when, when this was first looked at, it was so obvious. Uh, so yes. we knew we were building in at least six weeks, if not longer. As time goes on, you're probably going to want to adjust that. Um, but this is to be clearly socialized with our staff. This is oh, yes. Just because we don't vote on it tonight. No, very clearly um, socialized with that. And that. the teachers have this. Oh, everybody, this is only non union personnel. This is only non union. It already has been communicated that you are having this discussion. Yeah. Um, I'd like to hold, though. You could just, you know, yeah. I personally like to hold to the date. Um, because I yeah. other people expected us to drop the hammer and say, you know, you can't come into the building unless you're vaccinated. And I, I think we're trying to find a, a little sure. bit of middle ground to have people get the opportunity. I've heard people just say I didn't get to it. I just didn't get to it. Yeah. Um, so we're letting them get to it now. Um, yeah. And I can continue to bring that message back that we had this conversation. There's going to be a vote. The date won't change. So let's yeah. <laughs> act, you know, respond appropriately, assuming you're going to vote it through a couple of weeks. Very well socialized. And a, yes. and a survey went out asking them. So I think we are very much socializing where you're going here. Thank you. If there are no further comments, questions on this policy, then we move on to old business in the EI survey. Um, and I just want to give a little bit of background from last our last meeting. Uh, we talked a little bit about the DEI subcommittee. Um, Tracy and I were were appointed as the two of the first three subcommittee members. Um, and we talked a little bit about how our subcommittee will at the beginning comprise only the three three school committee members, um, but the meetings will take place in public on Zoom, optimally, um, to allow access to a wide range of voices um, so that we can hear from, invite in, and really engage with um, everybody who wants to have a voice heard and a seat at the table um, in this important work. Um, and so on that line, um, Aaron, can I get, oh, I have screen sharing. Um, I did attend the League of Women Voters meeting about the town, the Concord Select Board's uh, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Commission. Um, and I think it's very worth noting how different we are from, from that mm -hmm. um, endeavor. And, and in that we are really looking at how can we in our in our school committee role support the DEI work within the districts? Mm -hmm. um, and, and the town has its own charter that I have up here. 
Um, and the League of Women Voters just asked that we can uh, sort of share this with the broader community so, so that everyone knows that the, the, the Concord Select Board is looking for people to um, come forward and, um, and offer themselves up to be a part of the, um, the, the town's DEI commission. Mm -hmm. um, so here is the, the charter and um, and you can go fill out there's concrete that has an electronic green card, which is not too difficult to find. And I'm sure if you can find it, just you know the select board, uh, they will then uh, put you to the right place. Uh, they're looking to move in this as quickly as possible, and they're looking for as broad a pool of community members as that they can find. So great. So so that's what I wanted to share there. Um, and so we have two things. We, we have still one more seat to fill on the, uh, on the subcommittee. Um, and then I really uh, welcome, want to extend a welcome to Mr. Nanichi. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. And thank you so much for all of the work that you've done over the summer. It's been phenomenal to read about um, your plans for the year, for for your, you know, you, you've got a very full agenda ahead of you. And I just want to say that um, from, from the school committee perspective and from the subcommittee perspective, please, in whatever way that we can, we can help advance your goals, um, we're really looking forward to, to working with you on this. Uh, Tracy, did you have anything? Um, no, I'm just, I'm really excited to be a part of this team with Andrew and, you know, welcome you to your position, which is fantastic. And I think it's important that we all understand kind of the direction that you're looking to move in and be a part of the committee with us and some of your goals. So it'll be great to have those conversations. Um, yeah, and if you can, you know, maybe uh, the first meeting, you maybe can come and, and talk to us a little bit about you. You have a survey that's going out, and I think it's really important for the community to understand um, why the survey is so important to you. Um, and I would really welcome hearing uh, hearing you hearing hearing you, you, you communicate with the community about about that. Yeah, yeah. I, I, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I want people to get excited about this work because I know you're very excited. We're very excited, and I want that to be contagious. Yeah. Um, to the, the broader community. So, yeah. So, I think with that, we'll uh, move to finding our role. I don't know, Andrew, do you have anything that you want to say? He has lots to say. Well, well, I thought I heard it. 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 Well, thank you for the invite uh, to this evening's school committee meeting. Um, I think the year is off to a great start. Um, I'm definitely um, starting to have some conversations um, already with some of our school leaders and uh, some of our students and some of the clubs. And, you know, I sent out my welcome letter um, uh, yesterday and I've already received uh, quite quite the feedback uh, from some parents in town. And, and of course, uh, folks are utilizing my DEI feedback form, uh, which is great um, because it is, it is also uh, a space that folks can again, send me their input, their concerns, um, you know, areas of improvement that, that, they, that they are hoping for um, within this work. And so um, I've been reading a lot of a lot of the feedback so far, and and you know we've we've got we've got a lot of work to do um, uh, within this work. But again, very excited, um, uh, very engaged uh, with with folks in our school community, and I think um, as the year goes on, I think it's it will only grow uh, from there. But I do welcome the opportunity to to come back uh, to you all and 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 have a conversation around some of my goals, uh, some of the the, the planning that, that I have um, in the coming weeks in terms of, again, gathering those feedback uh, from folks in the community um, to better inform um, sort of a development of our strategic plan uh, going into the future. So appreciate, appreciate the invite this evening. Thank you. And um, so, so 
So for anyone who wasn't here at our last meeting, the reason we have two members chosen and not a third is that we were unfortunately not all in attendance last time. Fatima, we, we missed you. Um, and we thought that it was important that to, to finish out our subcommittee that we did have um, all school committee members present um, to, to make sure that everyone had input into this uh, conversation. Thank you. I appreciate um, the accommodations while I uh, I was away. As you all know, um, this is important to me and to everyone um, on on the committee and in our community. So I, I appreciate that, and uh, thank you for continuing the conversation today. So yeah, we need to ask for ask ask for room. Yeah. Um, yes. I simply want to share with you my my perception of this subcommittee, just to see if we're still on the same page. Um, because I think we've adapted it as we watch district internal district efforts through Dr. Hunter and Mr. Uh Kristen, you've been there uh, all the way, okay? So not not to be overlooked. Uh, and then we have seen uh, the select board move forward. So my understanding, I just put it out there to my colleagues to test, is that at the present time, our subcommittee, the primary focus is to see that this school committee is as effective as it can be in this space. So it's not a community-facing group per se, as some of them are. It's at the present time, a school committee-facing group to see that seven of us are highly engaged, highly informed, highly capable of uh, engaging in the work that a school committee can do around this it is not the same as the work that Dr. Hunter no. uh, and Christian can do. Is that, does that resonate with you folks? Yes. yes. It's a targeted effort that we could not accomplish as a full committee. And we, I think we felt that a subcommittee would give the time, attention, or a subgroup of the school committee to do this work and inform the full school committee as to the work that does. Is that, that Am I saying yeah. that actually the right way? Yeah. Okay. And uh, there might be a presumption uh, that because our colleague Fatima wasn't present at the earlier meeting, that we're holding this space for her. Uh, I don't hold that opinion. Um, rather, I would say this committee makes that decision and welcomes Fatima and anybody other than Sarah and Tracy who are already on it to. Uh, to voice uh, an interest and a commitment to doing this work because Correct. it's going to take some time. It's going to take uh, a certain skill set. Uh, hopefully, whoever joins it is going to complement the two of you and make the, uh, the subgroup even stronger. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we're going to pause and ask how do we how do we best fulfill the mission of that third seat and hear from Fatima, certainly uh, you, because uh, we didn't. Uh, uh, join us on the earlier uh, conversation. So I hope we have a couple of minutes, chairs, to engage in that tonight. Absolutely. Thank you. I'm sorry, Court. I just want to make sure I, I understand correctly. Um, were you asking me the question? Uh, do you want to serve on the committee? And if so, why? What, what can you bring to it? And I think anybody who wants to mm -hmm. uh, address that same question, I would hope they get an invitation. So I hope I'm not being too forward asking that. No, no, that's right. Sure. Um, yes, I, I, and my, my interest in DEI work uh, has been uh, uh, very uh, vocal and clear uh, since really uh, since you know before DEI was an acronym, and everyone who knows me has you know, knows that I've been. Uh, working on, 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 on uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion in our schools. Uh, from just my, my personal perspective and wanted to contribute uh, in any way that I could as, as a citizen, as a parent. Um, what I can, yes, I, I am still interested um, in, in contributing in the capacity of a member of the subcommittee um, on DEI. Um, and I think what I can bring uh, to the uh, subcommittee is um, the perspective. Everyone has an important perspective. We are all different um, in our ways. And um, uh, I think that I can uh, bring a perspective that um, 
that is not prevalent in, in, in our community or in our school community. committee. Um, I, I value our diversity as a committee and as a school, a school community. And um, I think that um, I can, I, I cannot say that I represent any minorities. I, I, um, I don't think of myself um, as such. Uh, I, I like to use my own experiences in, in, in this community, uh, in our school community to, to inform the, the, the change that I would like to suggest, that I would like for us to consider um, and explain um, and hopefully provide uh, the reasoning behind uh, the changes that I would like to see, that I would like to propose and for us to consider. Um, uh, I can talk about areas that um, I, I, I uh, worked on, again, before I came uh, on the school committee, uh, is to point to blind spots. I mean, we used this phrase a lot last year and uh, I, I like going back to it. And, that is my, um, that is the angle that I'm, I, I come at this uh, from, really. Um, I've always looked at this um, as uh, whenever there are uh, equity issues or diversity issues, it, it, I've, I've always believed uh, strongly that um, it stems from not knowing and not, not anything else. So for me, it's always a blind spot. And my role is to point to that blind spot and have a conversation. Um, and I'm, I'm looking also for my own personal growth, my uh, you know, learning from other perspectives and reconsidering my, my, my perspective. Um, so again, some groups that I have um, uh, advocated for, uh, uh, Voluntarily, um, again, are the, the low income uh, families in, in our community, uh, the uh, religious minorities, uh, special education uh, families, uh, because I have experienced uh, those, uh, those circumstances, that I, I live those, uh, those circumstances, and I can speak from my own personal experience. Um, and I have uh, access to voices that we may not necessarily uh, hear uh, for a number of reasons. Um, so I, 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 I would like to bring that to you um, because I see the interest. I see that we want to be comprehensive. We want to hear from everyone. We want to cover as much ground as, uh, as we possibly can. Um, so that is how I see my role. So the way through the chairs, uh, say, Tano, thank you. I uh, will choose not to vie for a position on this committee as much as I am dedicated to the goals of the committee. So, thank you very much for sharing those perspectives. I'm tapped out. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, I, I just wanted to ask. Yes, please. Uh, I have keen interest in uh, the work that was started a long time ago, uh, and I have seen the fruits of that work through the experience of my own kids that have been uh, going through uh, Concord High School. Uh, so I really appreciate uh, the scope and uh, the need for this work and the understanding um, of the benefit that uh, DEI work brings to our, our own students. Uh, because it, it is important to know that diversity helps our students when they go off to the, to the big world, they go off to college. Uh, and it, picks, uh, it impacts their life experience and, and my, and my parental view uh, positively. Uh, I, I feel that Fatima will serve very well in that position. I, I would uh, uh, just like to know how, uh, as a school committee member, I can um, also add to, to, to that process with questions and mm -hmm. um, 
if, if there is a good formal way. And I think we, we will have an opportunity to talk uh, deeper about um, uh, our roles and our goals during our uh, workshop, correct? That's, yes, that's correct. Yes. So, so once we figure out who's on the committee, then we can all meet and, uh, and start to really figure out our our protocols and they may they may evolve and, and how we operate may evolve. Um, I mean I think that as to, to course point like we're not operations, right? Like yes. we are figuring out how can we strengthen our, our policies, our budget practices, the, what, the things that we have in our purview. Mm -hmm. How how can we make sure that those are aligning and supporting with Mr. Nietzsche's work, with, mm -hmm. with, with Kristen's work, um, and with the work of our students and our faculty, and, and, uh, mm -hmm. and really how can we be a stronger school committee um, in, in this journey? Yes. Um, yeah. And so we'll, we'll figure out a way for like, taking questions or, or processing feedback or, or how we synthesize. Um, because I know that everybody, I, don't, I mean, just because not everybody is going to be on the subcommittee does not mean that this isn't work that everybody wants to be involved in. Correct. Um, yes, and that's what And we want to make sure that everybody does. We just think that having a subcommittee will best channel and be a more effective way of, of using our resources from a great more efficient yes yeah. yeah exactly okay thank you um so i think we have a, a, a nomination on the table well i we need to make to make the nominee better change the motion to nominate so are we at action items oh no Let's do that. No, 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 we are. So I think we set the table for that. Yes, uh, we'll move on. Okay. okay. Yes, we'll come back to that. Okay. Um, here it is. No, we're out. Exactly. <laughs> yes. I'll be brief. Um, so in your in your back in length is the, the updated memo. Uh, not much has really changed since I last reported on June 10th, which is good news. All of our projections held. Um, one of the things, while we call it a closeout, I, I sort of want to explain that we really don't close out until we get audited. We don't get audited until we have our preliminary audit is scheduled for next month, but then it takes months for the final audit to come in. So those numbers do change up until potentially February. Um, so a couple things. Um, I'm going to be starting at the high school list, the more complicated budget. Starting with the good news, we are projected to have an uh, EEB of 5%. Uh, at this time, I'm not 100% projecting any money left over in the general fund. Um, and if we have any money left over, you want it to be in significant. And the reason for that is because our EEB does not get certified after um, after the, D, uh, the, the Department of uh, the uh, DOR does all of the tax rates. So if we, if at the region, if we give money back to the communities, that changes their tax yeah. rates. So uh, at this time, I'm I'm not uh, projecting really anything left over. Uh, that could change. We're still in the we're still closing out some um, some purchase orders, uh, etc. But we have to get this all done. Uh, or our end of year report is due, and that's due at the end of next month. And that takes us a good two to three weeks. So I should have some, uh, I don't think much will change, but it will have some updated numbers uh, by, the, by the 14th. Um, so the general fund, if we were able to uh, prepay tuition, that final amount uh, is, is still to be determined because we are really at the mercies of the schools to get uh, invoices for the first three months, and even though we started in June, we still have about four or five left. Though we do know those amounts, so those are in my projections. Um, our bus bid, uh, we have put a bus bid together. All bids are due on September 20th. We gave uh, about a month for those bids to come in. We expect that to come in around 350000 um, as well as uh, the NAC books that were purchased uh, with your approval and the money moved and stabilization so the, the general fund is, in, is in, in great shape and nothing changed since really last report. Um, our revolving accounts, again, nothing changed in those. We do anticipate to have the same, around the same uh, beginning and any balances in both the food service account as well as the athletic account. And we will have the full um, 
circuit breaker um, amount for the high school, which is projected to be about $872,560. Uh, so that is good. So that's where we, we are with the high school and the revolving accounts. And then the ESSER grants, uh, nothing has changed. Uh, we were able to send the CARES Act money, uh, and then we're over, we were able to roll over uh, the emergency relief one, two, and three. And in that, I did update the grant deadlines just so you all know when that money has to be expended. So, any questions on the region? Remind me of that circuit breaker. That's a front load for fiscal 22 based on fiscal 20 numbers. Based on FY, so it's based on FY21. Uh, so, yes, so what we got in FY21 was $872,000. By law, we were able to carry over that amount, um, and we can't carry it over. So, next year, if for some reason, if FY22, if we get a million dollars, we have to at least expend eight hundred seventy-two thousand, and we can we can carry over the money. Forgive me. Back back up for me. Sure. Uh, we received eight hundred seventy-two in fiscal twenty. Fiscal twenty-one. Yeah. Okay. So typo here. Okay. Uh, in FY twenty. Last paragraph. So just want to understand it. I'm going to try to challenge it. Oh, first. Yeah. No, we received eight hundred seventy-two in circuit breaker monies in FY twenty-two, and we carry over one million. That is a cycle. Yeah, we should be monies in FY twenty-one. Thank you. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Okay, I got. Great. So I asked a question, um, and I would, I don't want to have a depth discussion, but the athletics team, um, as a private citizen, a couple of years ago, I objected to the race. He got erased, but it was um, made clear to me that there was very deep concern that it wasn't we saw it without raising those fees. And now we have a, quite a big <laughs> excess. And I don't think the athletic revolving fund is intended to fund capital projects. So I think we as a committee need to have a discussion as to whether it's appropriate to have this large excess of the fund and how, you know, what the budget is and how we should look at carrying this going forward. Um, what's the appropriate thing? That's just my opinion, and I don't want to, it's not an uh, agenda item, I don't want to get into it, but just food for thought. Um, and I just want to keep an eye on it. I can certainly bring ideas to the Dr. Archer, which she can be able to. No. I have a quick question. Uh, when it comes to the food service, uh, our students at the high school, they they are getting free lunch, right? So that deficit comes from the fact that we're, they're, they're not paying forward. They're not paying for participation is down. One of the things at the high school is that snack bar, um, the revenue was down from that the next, the next two years. So we talked with Bryce Jarrett primarily. Um, we decided to open school a certain way, and he's going to ramp up as we get settled and acclimated. So hopefully, we're going to keep getting closer and closer towards the remarkably great things he was doing. Not that what he's doing now is it, but it's not quite the same. Um, and continue to really try to bring back some of what we have. And you were encouraging students to eat outside, so. Some of the traffic is not going through the right. lunch room right now right. as well. Yeah. So it has to do really with the pandemic. It's the time right. of the year, yeah. coupled with it, it's just, you know, in uh, a rainy day in November, it's not going to be so much fun. That's go true. Going downtown, yeah. as I'm saying. <laughs> so, you know, we're going to be rainy day in September later this week. It's going to be so much fun. But, uh, yeah, so yeah, rainy day. Yeah. This is all COVID impact. Yeah. And, Trying to be sure you're staffed, but not overstaffed. But like when we brought all those kids back in April, thank goodness we had enough staff to do that, and um, lots of lots of variables for sure. Thank you, Jared. Sure. And then just to if any more questions on the region. And then for concrete, uh, much uh, 
that's complicated, as you know, because we are defined to the uh, We are expected to, uh, to end, end at zero. Um, and then we will have approximately about 255,000 from the food service balance that come from four to next year, which is what the beginning balance was. And then we are projecting right now to carry over uh, $649,694 in such a breaker. So that's also that's also good news. And we are still waiting for some prepayment invoices, and those are all factored into my numbers. Um, for tuition. Okay. Very good. Thank you, Thank you. Um, so smoking in bowls. This is just going to be a very quick check in um, as we've now set our workshop date. And, um, and just wanted to briefly share where we stood on the goals. Do you want to say the date again? Yeah, it was just it was the 16th. 16th from 3 to 5 p.m. Yes. Got it. Yep. And we'll be, everybody's committed to being in person. I just want to be sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Well, you're good in person on the 16th. I'll be here. Uh, how am I going to get in? Uh, if I must, yes, I would prefer to stay remote. But if I, if it's best for the training, the the, the training, yes, I will be in person. And just as a reminder, what we talked about doing is um, less of a train. Last year we did we did training with Dorothy Messer. Um, now we're all really experienced. It, we, we know the protocols, we know the practices. Um, Tracy, I think you've done training the course. Or no, not yet. You're, you will have <laughs> no idea what you yeah. so soon. Uh, and so we really wanted to take a deep dive into our goals through the lens of how can we be effective, not only being effective school committee, because I think that's sort of our overarching goal is to be just a stronger body um, together, right? Um, and so we carried over some of our goals or modified them a little. And even this is all just a framework for conversations. We will, during our workshops, really get into the weeds about what, what are our expectations to, to learn, what's the, what's the relevant information for us, how can we best access information, and how can we best communicate information and expectations. Um, and um, and so, so we will be looking at at COVID, including the takeaways from, from COVID and with it, you know, like the adjusting protocols and practices. Our budget, our policies, our superintendent support and evaluation, our community engagement, um, and then I think much deeper dives um, to the conversation we're having earlier into our cultural competency um, and to our special education. So I just wanted to put that out there, but, but this is where it's easy. It's so easy. <laughs> Two hours. <laughs> and we will be doing a little reflection, correct? Right? Oh, yes. And we'll be doing a reflection on this past year, um, and just sort of through the lens of as a company member, as a member of the community. Um, do you, uh, you sent out a document that was an outline of ways we could, you know, we could reflect. Mm -hmm. Do you, would it be helpful to have those beforehand so that they could be shared and synthesized, absorbed, so that the conversation can be more constructive, or should we instead prepare to bring them with us on the day of? Do you have thoughts on that? So it might be more efficient to synthesize it the way that we can do super evaluation and give people a chance to uh, make it back. I'm just thinking about the you know, the work that is doing. It's really, it would be a problem. Very correct. I'll have yes. an intermediate, which is we all produce beforehand, but no effort to synthesize by anybody, any way, until we're all in the room together, and then the group does the synthesizing. Because then it's the, the pushing. I just meant like absorb, like if I saw other people's yeah. stuff, other people's ideas, I could absorb. Would it, and I meant, I don't know the answer, I'm genuinely asking, would it be beneficial to have a little bit of time to absorb yes. and marinate on it? Yes. 
Okay. Before we announce. Yes. And if so, if we're going to submit them in advance, what would my death be? <laughs> so might the chairs receive them or a chair receive it? And when they're all uh, uh, collected, then disseminate them as yes. one group. So mm -hmm. I don't influence you, you don't influence yeah. me, and everybody has a clean version of their opinions. Right. And then collectively we ask, okay, how do we sift and sort this? I think it would be a... And I, don't, I don't know how much time we actually need to spend actually sifting and sorting it, because I think I think that being able to read everybody's thoughts and then process it on our own, that's what we're going to do an internal sifting and sorting that will inform our conversation uh, through the workshop. So I don't, I think that actually, if ever, yeah, if you can submit your thoughts and then we can. A couple days before. And a couple of days before and we can, and we can right. share what it out. Is this it's a Thursday, Thursday. Thursday. Oh. Monday. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's what I was going to say. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. that's like this Monday. So right. everybody knows where the rest is. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah, okay. Yeah. 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 We, have, we don't have a meeting next week. Okay. It's Monday the 13th, correct? Monday the 13th. Perfect. Right? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I wonder if, if we can just hold as a separate consideration the idea that uh, we are well into our five year strategic plan and alignment is important. Yeah. Uh, so just keep that on our radar that mm -hmm. uh, we're in year four of a five year. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be coming around very quickly yes, as well. Is. So yeah. uh, one doesn't necessarily uh, direct the other, but they all influence each other. So just, right. just have to be aware that that's coming at us again. Pretty it's fast. a good thing we had COVID in our five years to teach. <laughs> 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 Anyway, <laughs> yes, thank you. All right, okay. So everybody agrees with the practice or the protocol that we're going to have. Everybody submits to that's the spoken hub to one person, and then with the little packet, will we send yeah. that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sense? You can submit. Everybody, you can submit. You know, send it right to everybody. Okay. Sure. Yeah. We'll do Sarah by this Monday. No, no, no. no. By next Monday, 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 and uh. Cynthia and Sarah, will we be sending also the questions around what we would like to see from the administration that really touches on the communication, how we communicate with the administration? We, we talk about reflections. Here. Right. The, so this is another, you're asking. If but this is, uh, 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 I'm talking about the goals for the school committee. Are we also including a portion of that? Oh, how we communicate with them? Right. And we don't have that. I mean, it's something we talked about, um, but we didn't put it as a goal. We, we could consider putting. And, well, we, and the reason why we're doing this is because we're going to get together, right? And uh, we're going to have an opportunity to work together in a workshop. So coming prepared might just speak things up. I guess as, as a new person, you know, I'm kind of this brand new. I would like to see us develop norms for how we're meeting, how we're communicating, and maybe that is the work we do together, just to make this committee, you know, as cohesive as we can, just moving forward. And I think the way we were talking about is your reflection piece. So we're just responding to that. But then also, if you have ideas, we would just talk about that together during and, the and I was just making sure that that is it's, 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 yeah. figuring out how we best communicate yeah. figuring out like and so we should all we should look at our the, the book that Cynthia made last year of our, mm -hmm. you know yes. yeah. um, of, mm -hmm. of how we do our practices and um and just think about how we operate um and I guess too you know moving forward Zoom, Zoom has been wonderful for a lot of things, but I think that it's it's very hard. I've been on the other side of it, and I'll find this on the other side today, and it, the interface is not always great. So if we're expecting our, our kids to be in school, mm -hmm. I, my personal opinion is we should just move to just strictly, not strictly, I shouldn't say strictly in person, but unless, you know, traveling or something else is coming up, because I think it's a challenge to, you know, you can't always hear what's happening, and so, especially for this meeting, definitely in person, but, you know, maybe we have to think about what the direction we're moving in just to be forward-facing to the community. You know, the expectation is if you're quarantined, you may not get 
Zoom, you know, you're going to have to go to the classroom. Maybe we need to start thinking about that also when everything. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. We'll definitely discuss that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. There, there are protocols. There are best practices. There's a lot of stuff. We might even look at. There are laws. And there are policies, correct? But you know, I might think we go back to what were the pre-COVID policies. Maybe we need to start operating like that. And this is all just you know food for thought. I just want to make sure that includes our workshop. Right. And then that you know we had to operate under open meeting law, which mm -hmm. now has been. Changed until I think it's April 82. Okay. <clears throat> so we need to take that into it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah, just to wrap that up, a little off topic, but not totally. It's been 18 months since you met in this room at night, and um, March 10th of 2020 was the last time. If you want a little respect, watch me and tell the committee what's coming in around. It wasn't even on the agenda of COVID, but I remember saying to the chairs, there's no way to not talk about this, and you can hear me talking about it closing in on me two days before we close. Um, and I would never, I've done this a long time with school committees, and I would never have thought I'd miss the evening night meetings, but I sit here and say, we're glad you about And so much fun, you know, I've been home now during these good long days, and it's just so, so much better to be here with you all. Yes. And um, so thank you. I'm okay. glad we made the shift back. And, I don't know if we have the same joy as the kids. goals on to action item. Finally. Right? Okay. The first I a motion to approve staff child enrollments. Oh, here we go. You got that? Uh, yes, you have two. I have two. Two uh, high school teachers, three and a half students. Seven minutes early. So I'll put a motion on the floor. The last floor to speak to her if she wishes. Uh, I move that the Concord and Concord Carlisle School Committee vote to approve the following staff request to enroll the children in CPS, CCRSD for the upcoming 2021 2022 school year and tuition be waived. Uh, Radka. Grein, teacher at CCHS, uh, apologies if I pronounced incorrectly, her daughter to attend the seventh grade at CMS, and second, uh, Courtney Vada, teacher at CCHS, daughter to attend kindergarten at Willard. I think the fun part is these are both brand new hires, and um, one went on a tour on the orientation, came back and said, bring my daughter, and the other one we hired very late, and um, she asked, Right so that's just feels really good that they yeah. feel so good about us already that they're bringing their children with them yes. as they become new employees. Yeah. So there will be a second. 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 Discussion? We'll have a chance to see the whole roster of new employees at some time. Yes. Sometime soon, I'm sure. But I think. Welcome. Welcome to all of them. Yes. Is <laughs> regional? Yes. Is still Sorry. Anderson, I for both. Who's I for both? Murano, I for both. Ms. Dutch, I for both. Mustafi, I for region. Rainy, I for both. And Wilson for region. Great. Thank you. Um, and so now we have the votes to appoint third member to the DEI subcommittee. Um, is there are there is there a nomination? Or are there nominations? I'd like to move that the committee uh, appoint Fatima Mesdat to uh, serve on the DEI subcommittee. Is there a second? Second. 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 Fatima, thank you. And uh, again, uh, thanks to Tracy and Sarah. A reminder that. Uh, as I understand it, your first charge is to develop your charge and bring it uh, forward to this committee's recommendation. Or to work. Not necessarily the point, but work in. Okay. Well, if there's a little Anderson, I is that I for both? I'll stop the I for region. Brady I for both. And Wilson for region. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and let's see. 
we are allowing any additional public comments if there's any remaining thoughts. Raise your hand. I see no hands raised. And so with that, I'll retain a motion to adjourn. Ms. Judge, I for both. 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 Ms.